Hi and welcome to episode three of the Podium Podcast. Yes, I'm sir. your host, Kobe Robbins, and I'm welcoming my good friend, my co-host, Seth Stein. What's going on? Nothing. It's Tuesday. It's almost 1 p.m. Nothing much. Got class at 2.50. It's the last class of the day. And got a case study to finish today. That's what I got to do. Yeah, I know we have homework, and I love baseball season. I love baseball. Because too. when we have work, there's games at 2.30, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock. I just hear baseball. I don't hear schoolwork. Facts. So let's get into it. The it Detroit is, Tigers. Before that, it is postseason day. It is. It's exciting. We got a lot of new teams that haven't been in for a while. So that's what I'm excited about. That's, that's something I love about every sport. If there's a few teams, two or three teams that haven't made it in for a while. Uh, the Mets and the Tigers and the Padres back in the postseason. I'm excited. Um, obviously, the Dodgers are definitely the favorites to win the World Series because of Shohei. Um, I'm gonna. I'm rooting for the Guardians. I mean, I'm from Ohio, and I like to see Ohio teams win. So, um, go Guardians. Okay, I don't really know what you're talking about, but uh, we'll move on. Um, the Detroit Tigers are gonna win the World Series. I'm not a Tigers fan, but um, I'm from Detroit. All my friends are so excited. Sure. It's amazing because I was talking to a couple of them yesterday, and they went to games this past week. Oh yeah. To see them continue to progress and improve and eventually clinch a wild card berth and the ticket prices skyrocketed. Oh, I went sure to a game did. this year with my friends, was able to sit close to the plate for around ten dollars, including fees. Now they're upwards of 150, 170, because it really shows to me what Tigers baseball means for the city. Mm-hmm. It kind of makes sense why people don't go to games of a team that isn't successful. But when they I mean, start I to play... I speak on that. I mean, the yeah. Reds have not been successful. They're just an average team who end 500 pretty much every year. So there's not a lot of people by this time of the year at the games. I mean, when we went a week and a half ago, there was not even, like, half capacity. It was pretty... It was low attendance. Yeah, it was pretty empty, especially for a team that... I mean, they weren't great this year, the Reds, but they were mediocre, yeah. I would say. Um, but also shout out Great American Ball, Ballpark. The mist was incredible. Yeah. It was hot. The mist. The mist was amazing. Um, so we talked to the Tigers, and let's get into it. Let's take a look at oh, AJ manager AJ Hintz said. Yeah, but this is called punching your ticket to October, okay? Special teams do special things. And we got an opportunity to do something special. We ask a lot out of you guys all year. All year, we've asked a lot out of you guys to do something for the guy next to you. And when I asked you in, in the middle of the season, remember I asked you, what kind of team do you want to be? I guess you wanted to be a playoff team. Seth, what do we think about this post-game speech? I think it was great. It got the boys hyped in the locker room. Champagne was flying. They deserve it. This team and franchise have not had success in winning, winning, just a winning culture for a while. And it's great to see. I mean, um, they went 31 and 13 to finish out the season. That punched their ticket as a wild card spot. That, that team, that, those numbers shows that team earned that spot. And I think they do. I don't really know too much about the roster, um, in Detroit, um, I just know Keel Badu is like my favorite name in baseball, and I'm not even sure if he's still a Tiger. I'm, is he? I'm not sure. I don't think he is, but we love Akil. Um, I think what uh, Coach Hinch had to say, especially, the, is this the first time he's made the playoffs since the scandal, yeah? Yeah, it is. This could be big. It's going to prove a lot as a manager himself. Um, I mean, it takes time to take a team to the playoffs. And he was very patient with 2017. I don't even know how many years ago that was now. But like six years ago, it, that's, it's been a while. And I'm sure he's very happy. Um, he spoke beautifully. I mean, he even said himself, like, punching your own ticket into October. Um, special teams do special things. They did special things there. 
they were on a generational run. They looked amazing. Yeah. And as you mentioned, AJ Hinch, after the scandal, a lot of people were really coming for his head, and rightfully so, mm -hmm. but he goes to an organization which does have a winning culture, going back to the 70s and 80s, Alan Trammell, Sparky Anderson, and Jim Leland, legendary manager. But he built this team from the ground up. The Tigers have not been very successful, even with him there. I think that maybe a new regime could be in place if this AJ is Hinch was not successful. I mean, I think if this is a successful playoff run, when I mean successful, I mean maybe win the wild card, and then the next series, maybe it goes, the, the next series out of five, yeah. Yeah. I'd say if they bring it to five games, I think that's successful playoffs if they get eliminated there. Yeah. Because this is a team that, that we don't know what's going to do in the playoffs because they haven't been in so long. Um, and what I really, really liked about this locker room speech was the ending. And he said, when I asked you in the middle of the season what you wanted to be, he said, I guess you wanted to be a playoff team. And again, it's the record. Like, you, I mean, you, you noted that they were 55 and 63 in early August. That is just a little over a month and a half ago now. And I mean, as I said a minute ago, they went 31 and 13 to finish the season. That's crazy. 13 games, that's not a lot of losses right there. That shows how confident they are, and they're playing amazing, and they're playing the Astros. Yeah, they're playing the Astros. And AJ Hinch is going back home to face the, the, the Astros. It's going to be exciting, and I think it's definitely going to be some something more people tune into than you think. Yeah, it's a great story for them to go to Houston. A great matchup, pitching matchup today. The game starts at around 2.00. It's Tariq Skubal, who won the American League Triple Crown for pitchers, had the highest ERA, strikeouts and wins. And you mentioned end of the quote, and I think this whole quote encapsulates what AJ Hinch, mean, AJ Hinch means for the team, but mm -hmm. what this team is all about. I love how he said, we ask a lot of you guys all year to do something for the next guy to you, for the, for the guy next to you. And that is the next man up mentality. Baseball is a team sport. Yes, there are individual accolades. I think that there's batters and pitchers, and I think there's definitely a case for individual players making teams, but the only way you're doing anything in the regular season and getting to the postseason is if you have pitching, batting, specifically relief pitching. And I know Scooble... Rotation's heavy, too. Yeah, and I know Scooble is mega-talented, probably the best pitcher in the American League this moment. But since that deadline when they got Jack Flaherty, they've had one of the best bullpens. Oh, yeah. Well, I, when I had that happen, I knew that was going to change everything. I was shocked by the news because I think Flaherty is highly underrated in the league. I don't think he's talked about too much. I think a few years ago he was talked a lot about, but then since then it's kind of died down. And he's proven he is a successful and confident player. But it really showed how good they are. Yeah, and I just love talking about the Tigers because it's been unfortunate for me living in Detroit. I mean, yeah, I mean, like Michigan, yeah. your whole childhood didn't beat Ohio State, so you wouldn't really know what winning's like, so. Uh, I guess I wouldn't, but I think the last three Michigan Ohio State games have gone in Michigan's favor. I'm not sure. Let's look that up, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. I'm not sure about that one. But that's besides the point. Um, I want to move on, but before I do, I just want to talk about how the Tigers are in the playoffs, and I should be it's celebrated. And regardless of what they do, for me, regardless of what they do, it's a successful season. I agree. Yeah. I mean, if, I don't think, like, my English teacher in high school, my, my he was also my baseball coach for five years. He is a Tigers fan. He's from the area. You know, I've known a little about Tigers baseball for so long now because of this, and, like, if you asked me when I talked to him back in the beginning of this season if the Tigers were going to make the playoffs, I probably would have said no. And I probably would have said, you know, the Reds were going to make the playoffs. Because, you know, every year I become so confident with my team. But I don't even think my teacher was so confident in the Tigers because that's how little the fans can trust them because they've been so not even inconsistent, just awful the last seven, ten years. 
yeah, the last time they had anything of relevance, I know they made the playoffs in 2014, but it was with Victor Martinez, Miguel Cabrera, that nasty rotation, which mm-hmm. had a six-game series against the Red Sox in 2013, um, but lost. And it's been a long time in coming. And yes, some may call this a fluke, but a 31-13 and 13 record not only means you're winning, but there's so much pressure. If it's 29 and 15, you're not making the playoffs. Every game matters. And in baseball, you never know what's going to happen. There's injuries. There are calls by the umps, which have been noted, because I think that in the next couple of years, there could be some robotic umps. We'll see what happens with that. But every game mattered. And for them to lock in in early August in a tight race with teams ahead of them by numerous games, it's pretty impressive. So roar, roar, Tigers. Let's see what they can do in the best of three series in Houston. Let's move on to another improbable playoff team who started off the season with a really bad record, to be honest. Yeah. The uh, New York Mets. So, yeah, the New York Mets, um, they also been pretty inconsistent. Um, I mean, now we're flipping over to the National League. Um, in my opinion, I think the Mets are... A very consistent team. I think they're very similar to the Reds. I think they either have a good season or they have a bad season. And you know, by the looks of the beginning of the season, I would have told you they had a bad season. They were going to end up having a bad season and not make the playoffs. But they went on a tear to finish the season off. I mean, I mean, I watched. I got the chance to watch a few games. I happened to actually watch the game yesterday where they clinched. Where we're going to see in a second. Uh, but Lindor said they were hitless, I'm pretty sure, going into the seventh inning. They took the lead. It was 3 nothing. They took the lead. It was, it became, I think, 6-3. And, I, you know, I was like, wow, they really just came back. And, of course, in the top of the eighth, they blew it. Or the bottom, whatever it was. They blew it. Edwin Diaz... Absolutely lets up four runs. Now they're losing 7-6. What do you do? What is happening in this situation? The most consistent batter is up the plate. Iglesias. Gets a hit. To continue, he was 0-3. That hit continued his uh, 20-plus game hitting streak. And who's up after? No other than Francisco, Francisco Lindor. And what does he do? He hits it out of the park to take a lead it was very impressive a lot of people that we know have made a debate that Lindor should be winning MVP over Shohei Otani I don't disagree but I see why Shohei should be winning but I also could see why people want Lindor Um, but let's see what Lindor had to say after the game Francisco, what did you guys say to each other after after you did lose the lead in the bottom of the eighth? There was anything that had to be said or anything to keep fighting, guys. You just fight, fight, you just fight. You know, you got to play twenty seven outs, and sometimes you got to play even more. Um, you just got to fight, fight, fight. Embrace the moment. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. It's going to even get. It's even going to get harder from here on on um, now. So we just got to keep on going. I love what he said because it was simple. He simplified what the team needs to do moving forward. He probably mentioned the word fight around 10 times. Yeah. And I think that in these baseball games, it isn't just physical, it's mental, especially the plate. And when you're going against these pitchers who in the postseason have the, exper- have the expertise, some of the best players in the game, they have the curve, they have change up, they have a lot of off speed, and then they just have the heater. And I think that for him... To say you play 27 outs and sometimes more, he understands the reality. It's not going to be easy. They're down and out. They're going into Milwaukee against a team that... They struggle against. Yeah, they struggle against. But they won the last series against just last week. And Lindor's the leader. And I think that there was criticism for Lindor the last couple years because had that big contract. The Mets, ran by Steve Cohen, really were spending a lot of money, but not that much production. And for them this year to start off like that, and I remember reading an article in May, seeing the Mets, or one of the worst teams in baseball again, I'm like, they're in New York. They're spending all this money and nothing's producing. Like, what is going on? We're all so confused. And That's how I feel about most New York sports yeah. recently. Like, 
I mean, soon we'll get into the situation that's going on with the Knicks, but I feel like the Knicks have been in a similar place. The Rangers were in a slump for a period of time, and now they're, I mean, a top team in the league, but they can't get past a certain point. And I also think the Yankees are very similar. They they spend so much money. And, yeah, you can have a 90-win season, but that doesn't mean anything. When you get to the playoffs, you have to win every game. There's no chance of losing. Because, again, personally, I believe baseball is the most mental game of any sport. And you're at the plate. It's just you and yourself. You're waiting for that ball to come. You can't just be like, oh, I'm going to swing now. It's all about how you perceive how the ball is coming at you. I believe that Lindor pushed limits. He was amazing. As you said, he said fight 10 times. That's all you could do in this situation. When you're trying to clinch a playoff spot, especially in the situation that we probably won't see again for a while with the Braves and the Mets, both at least needing a one win out of a two-game doubleheader to make the playoffs, it's crazy. They were down the whole game, no hits into the seventh or sixth inning, and you go ahead and you you take the lead in the eighth inning again, it's nuts. He's great. He's got the mentality, and he said, look at me. I'm the captain now. Yeah, and what I love about this turnaround for the Mets, and we're going to get into some, some analytics for a second, is since their turnaround in late May when they've just been on a tear for the last half of the season, their on-base percentage has been fourth in MLB. And I think in this day and age, it's strikeouts and homers. Mm-hmm. I think that the majority of Baseball fans can agree on that. And on-base percentage isn't really looked at as much. And I understand it's this metric that is just telling you how much they get on base. It's not these advanced, you know what I mean? But that, to me, is such a vital statistic because you want to get on base, walk, hit by a pitch, infield single, home run, any way you can to get on base to allow... Anything to happen, get a runner in scoring position, especially with the new rules and the bases, they're big, They're bigger now. You know what I mean? If you yeah. get on first, you can steal. Or? I mean, that's what Lindor does. Yeah. Lindor, I mean, I don't know if they played him in the second game, but I know he was at least one um, stolen base short of back-to-back 30-30 seasons. So, like, again, like, you're right about the ceiling. Yeah, and it influences bunting. Again, like, any way you can, and for me... As a baseball player, I played almost my entire life, all the way through high school, on-base percentage and getting on base was the most important thing for me. I remember my junior year, for some reason, I got walked all the time. And yes, I wanted to get the bat on the ball and swing. To be honest, even if I struck out, I still like wanted to swing. But I realized one game when I was talking to my coach, when I could have gotten walked again, it was a full count, and I swung at a bad pitch. He's like, why'd you swing like that? I'm like coach i have not basically swung the bat in the last four at bats like i keep getting walked he's like kobe this is a team sport you know mental mistakes happen but getting on base is what what we need you to do yeah and he consistently told me we have you in that spot in the order to get on base you can steal so you can use your base running ability and other players will hit you in and after that i really realized what my role was but also there are so many different players and various ways to win ball games. And the Mets have just been consistent. And I think that they have this opportunity to really show what they're all about. Because, you know, if they have a disappointing postseason performance, that's what people are going to talk about because they're in a huge market. So this is a crucial series. I'm saying they're going to win, but they need to show out. Keeping it in New York, um, let's head over to the New York Knicks and some big news. Just the other night, uh, all of a sudden we got a text saying uh, Carl Anthony Towns is a New York Knick. What are your thoughts on that, Kobe? Man, as a Celtics fan, don't worry. This is my opinion. I'm not going to be biased because I still think the Celtics are the best team in the NBA by far. I don't love the move for either teams, but particularly the Knicks. Um, we'll listen to what Jalen Brunson had to say in a second. I really enjoy what he said as the leader of the team. Incredible player and great person off the court. But you give up Dante DiVincenzo, who, if he didn't show it through the regular season, in the postseason, he was remarkable. He is not just a 3-and-D player. 
He can go to the rim, handle the ball. Yes, he has the great shot that he's continuously worked on ever since being that sixth man in that amazing Villanova tournament run a couple years ago. And he's bounced around the league. And he finally came to New York, the Nova Knicks, and he had an incredible role. And I think in the postseason, yes, talent is, is needed, but chemistry and really mentality and effort is valued more in my opinion. And you give up him and Julius Randle, who wasn't a great fit with Jalen Brunson, kind of injury prone, had really spurts. I remember last year he couldn't hit anything in the first 10 games. It was like historic. Could not hit anything. And then all of a sudden the next 30 games, he was on it. Then wasn't able to play in the playoffs, which is unfortunate. But I see Julius Randle as a poor man's Carl Anthony Towns. Carl Anthony Towns is the most, one of the most impressive big men in the modern era. But yeah. He wasn't great in last year's postseason. And for the Knicks, they're in this upper echelon right now. They're not in the trying. They're not in the contending. They have this opportunity in the East to be a top three team. And a top three, three team means Eastern Conference Finals and potential finals appearance. I just don't see how getting Carl Anthony Towns, who wasn't great in the postseason, was really evident last year. That he struggled shooting the ball especially, and not a great fit with the Timberwolves either, is going to help much more than Randall and DiVincenzo. I mean, I agree. I can't really speak too much about it. All I, I'm not the biggest NBA guy. I like college basketball more. But I do know in the press conference um, that we're about to look at, you, the players are not supposed to be talking about this yet apparently because it's not confirmed is that correct yeah it isn't confirmed yet yeah. so apparently they get fined i saw i think something on tiktok about it the other day and i thought it was interesting um but i mean i do think these leagues are petty and they find players for the little things and that is a little thing but um i know cat i mean i remember the hype when he came out of college and went right into the league i remember when he got drafted i mean when i hear cat's name i hear you know top player in the league He's just one of those guys that you know everywhere. And I think no matter what is going on in the Knicks organization right now, I think he'll be a great addition. As much as it might not be as beneficial as the other two guys that they traded away, I think he'll still be beneficial. I mean, he's still... I mean, it also do with how the dynamic of the team works, and we obviously don't know how that's going to work yet, and they don't know how it's going to work, because it was very shocking news to all the players. I mean, I don't remember what player it was, but I saw... a conference video of him saying like the a reporter asked him and he was like we got cat and i was i thought it was funny i was like my they, these guys just are sh- as shocked as cat was i remember cat tweeted dot 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 because he wasn't sure what was going on he wasn't in the loop of being traded and like it must sting as a player who's not in the loop of what's going on especially when it's about trade talks like I would like to be, if I was a, a professional athlete, I would like to know if I was being traded or there was trade um, speculation around my name. Because it's not fair to someone just be like, oh, basically the Timberwolves have packed their things, go to New York. Especially what Cat's done for the franchise. He basically rebuilt the Wolves. And he's been through it all the last, I don't know, however many years he's been on the team. But it's not fair to a player to say, like, pack your things up. We'll see you when you come back. Like, it's not fair to him, and I'm sure he's just as confused as everyone about this trade. Yeah, and I love how you mentioned that he rebuilt the Wolves. People forget that, yes, Anthony Edwards is this otherworldly player and Team USA won and really up and coming and gives a lot of hope for Wolves fans, but Carl Anthony Towns, when he was drafted in 2015, that team was nowhere. They had Kevin Garnett in his final season, really just this bad or mediocre team, and they stayed in that area. And then they got Jimmy Butler, and Carl Anthony Towns has been there for nine years and put us all into the organization. It is a business, but I would say that I'm not sure because I have no relation to the NBA. I have no idea, but I would say it should be common courtesy for them to talk to and be like, hey, we're considering trading you. We love you, but it's a business, and that's all they have to say. Exactly. But he's been there. He's was their focal point of the offense for the longest time. If you time. mentioned the Timberwolves, I'd ask you 100% of every time, 
What does Cat have to be involved with this? Because he's he is the voice of the team. Yeah. He's the guy when you hear the, the team's name, that's who you think of. That's who I've thought of for the last nine years. Yeah, I agree. And even though earlier I criticized the fit, Cat is one of the best big men in the league. And I think that he can revive his career in New York. He's also from there. In my opinion, I think he's happy about this move. He plays with Brunson, who can score whenever he wants. Really incredible player. And as you mentioned, Brunson, earlier, let's take a look at what he said in the press conference. My job is to come out there and be the best player, best teammate I can be on the court. Um, I don't deal with anything front office-wise. It's not my job, nor that, well, maybe in the future, down the line. But um, it's just that's not my role. I got to do my role, perfect my role, and um, just be the best teammate I can be. When I was reading about this and listening, it showed me what type of leader he is. Yeah. He had this calm demeanor, really just wanted to focus on the season and just showed his commitment to excellence of the team. And yes, he could have gotten fined, possibly, I'm not sure, if he mentioned Cat or the players they lost, stuff like that. But I remember before that question, he's like, this is how the season's starting, really. Because he wants to be asked questions by reporters that are meaningful, informative, yeah. and really can gain a glance for the viewers of what he's thinking and what he's excited for in this big season of his coming off a possibly MVP season last year. And I think that what I really liked was he said, I got to do my role, perfect my role, and be the best teammate I can be. That's completely factual. He needs to be the best teammate he can be and he needs to have the ball. And I think that he will work with Cat and their amazing potential starting lineup of him, Hart, Bridges, and Anobi and Cat, and they also got Mikel Bridges, Nova Nix in the offseason from uh, down the street in Brooklyn. And it does make basketball fans and Knicks fans especially excited. They should be. They, because they're lethal. Also, they're going to be lethal. But the team's also been in shambles the last yeah. 10 years. Like, It's exciting for any team who you're a fan of that's been struggling for so long to finally become good. Again, with the Bengals, we spoke about this in episode one. I dealt with this my whole childhood. They were so bad. And now they're considered one of the top teams in the league. And it's crazy to think about when people talk so highly of the Bengals. When I when people still when I think about the Bengals, I still think about Andy Dalton, AJ Green, Marvin Lewis. That's that's the Bengals I think of. I don't think of this Joe Burrow team yet. As much as I love Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. Tyler Boyd and Joe Mixon, like that's not the team that is stuck in my head because that wasn't the team that I grew up with. It's obviously this generation's team that they're growing up with. And for the Knicks, young Knicks fans, it's going to be exciting. They're going to have a great ride to watch. Yeah, and I just want to touch on who Jalen Brunson is as a person and what he's been through. I think that he came into the league, young player, Mavericks, second-round pick, and really unproven, was behind Luka. And I remember a couple months ago, Mark Cuban, the owner of the Mavs, was talking about how something with Jalen Brunson's family or like money, I don't know really what he was trying to say about how he couldn't resign him. And Jalen Brunson simply said, it was a better opportunity for me in New York. That's where I went. People were criticizing the four-year $120 million deal for a backup point guard at the time. And he's completely taking the city on his shoulders. And he's not a young player anymore. He's not even a veteran. He is the dude. He is the guy. He's in his prime. And it's going to be interesting to see how he meshes with Cat. And also remember that Tom Thibodeau and Cat have a bit of a rocky relationship. Some could say, but that also could be speculation. You never know yeah. with the NBA because what a crazy league. But... He's just truly showing his leadership ability. And the last thing I want to say was he said, it may be in my future down the line, being in the front office, which I thought was a nice sound bite because maybe he does want to be in the front office after he retires. Maybe. That's but, what a lot of yeah. players do. Speaking, I mean, like, as a hockey fan, a lot of players or former coaches go up into being the GM, 
like Barry Trotz is currently the GM and I want to say current president of the Nashville Predators. With the Blue Jackets, Rick Nash, considered the greatest Blue Jacket of all time. Um, he just got promoted in, I mean, he was the assistant general manager. He just got promoted to something else. I don't remember what it was. Um, maybe it was president of hockey operations, but I don't remember. But this is very casual for a team. And I mean, it would be great to see specifically him to go up after he's done, but that won't be for some time now. Um, and that's something we can come back to. Yeah, the final thing that I want to say about this move and Jalen Brunson's soundbite and everything like that, Knicks fans have a lot of things to be excited about. One of the top teams in the East, really tough conference, to be honest, but there's going to be some great games, so we should be excited for opening night in the TD Garden in Boston, Celtics ring ceremony against the New York Knicks, New York Knicks, it'll be a great game. So let's get into it. College football. College Ashton, football. GNT. What do we Ashton think about GNT? him, Seth? Seth? Personal opinion? I think he's winning the Heisman this year over Travis Hunter. Yes, Travis Hunter is a two-way player, which you don't see too often. Two-way player, just like his his current coach was, um, Deion Sanders. Um, Travis Hunter... Great. I think he's better at defense than offense, um, specifically. He's a great... Uh, is he safety or cornerback? Cornerback. Corner, he's a great cornerback. Um, I mean, he knows how to just launch himself to the ball, pick it off. Though I think last week or the week before, he made some crazy... I think it was the past week. He made some crazy pick. It was like a, a curl route. And all of a sudden, this guy just launches himself, picked off, and he's celebrating. It's crazy to see. He's doing great things on the field. But I do think JNT overall is the better option as of going into week six of college football the heisman yeah and i think a heisman the heisman award is an individual award yes and i think it's tough to take away from the top fbs programs because players such as a quarterback need to have success in terms of winning even people to win in my opinion even people saying shador should win the heisman which i don't agree with yeah at all i would say Never. Like, it's not, that's not going to happen without a chance. That's not happening. Yeah. But it's cool to see. I mean, over the last five Heisman's, they're just pretty much the top programs in the league. It's good to see Boise State and Colorado in this nomination because all we ever see is Ohio State, Oregon, LSU, Alabama, Georgia. These are the, the teams we always see. I know Carson Beck's a favor to win the Heisman. I also don't think that is the highest change. I know Jalen Milrow is also. But I really think it's going to come down to Travis Hunter and Ashton Janty. Yeah, me too. And because, as we both talked about, the Heisman Award offers these incredible players the ability to showcase it and go to New York, great ceremony. You're a Heisman for life. Yeah. One of the Heisman House and Nissan commercials. Besides Joe which Burrow. Are, yeah. Joe Burrow's the only Heisman winner that's not in the commercials. Yeah, which is, I want to ask you about that in a second. But with GNT, he's gotten 845 rushing yards yeah. and 13 touchdowns in four games, it's which nuts. is incredible, remarkable, and spectacular. 13 tutties? Tremendous. I mean, I can say so many things about him. He's quick. He's 5'9", 215, but he's just also... This power running back as well. But that's like an average running back yeah. size. It's like it's not like something special. Like I mean, the last running back who won the Heisman happened to be Derrick Henry, and Derrick Henry's like a beast. Like he's yeah. built like a beast. I mean, you look at him this past week in the NFL. He had like his first carry was for eighty-seven yards and a touchdown. I think he had like two hundred something yards the total game. It's like nuts. Like he's just built like crazy. I'm not saying like. Janty's not built, but he's not the same physique as what Henry was in college at Alabama, and it's crazy to see. Yeah, I think now's a good time to take a look at what JT for Boise State said after their latest win. 100% for the team. You know, every play is not going to be perfect. Every play is not going to be a big wide gap, but, <clears throat> you know, Man, my guys are working hard each play to try to make space for me. And, you know, that means a lot to me. So every opportunity I get, 
with the ball in my hands, you know, I take pride in that. You know, I'm holding the whole program in my hands and, you know, I'm going to do my best, you know, to get us yards. I love this quote because there's numerous times that he says for the team, these guys, this program, it's not about himself. And he would honestly have the right to be like, I do this, this is how I prepare. I break tackles. There was a play where he broke like seven tackles for a touchdown. I mean, yes, you could say that's all him. The Heisman Award is individual, but I love when he says, that means a lot to me. When these offensive linemen and tight ends and wide receivers block for me. And every opportunity I get with the ball in my hands, I take pride in that. And he has to because he understands what Boise State is as a college football program, but also what he means to the team. He knows that he's the focal point of the offense, and he carries that on his shoulders. Yeah. And they help him do that. And I think that it's just giving so much credit to the team. And I know I've said that a lot, but I should mention that these offensive linemen are just doing such a phenomenal job. Because they when are. JNT gets a bit of room, two or three yards, that's when he breaks tackles. What if I, you give him room in the line of scrimmage, he's going to be gone. I agree. But what I specifically like about what he said um, was the quote where he, in here he said, my guys are working hard each play to try to make space for me, which I love. If you go look at film of this guy, massive holes through the O-line. It's not like you see this like every on every team. It like... They are perfecting this for this guy to succeed and carry this team down the field each drive. I mean, you noted he has 305 yards in the fourth quarter alone, which is nuts. Four games, five games, whatever it's been. 13 touchdowns, almost 1,000 rushing yards. This guy's on pace to break records, and he's on pace to break Derrick Henry's Heisman records. And I would love to see that. Because, I mean, when Devontae Smith won the Heisman, I was very, very happy because I think to, in today's football, the Heisman is more looked at the quarterback position, and it isn't. I really wanted Marv to win it last year because, I mean, Marv was breaking rec records and after records and records, and you don't see that too often that a, a non-quarterback position is in the lead for that. And even with Travis Hunter, it's great to see but again, it's hard to pick someone who's doing two things on two different sides of the field. Like, yeah, you can, you know, I think I saw something about Dion talking about how his assistant coach was like, you know, you got to give the ball back to Travis because he needs 10 more yards for like his like six consecutive um, 100 yard rush, uh, 100 yards receiving games. And like, I don't even know if they ended up giving him another like shot to get the 10 yards, but like. It's crazy to see what these players are doing. And, like, yeah, I'm happy it's not quarterbacks because I feel like the last decade it's just been quarterbacks after quarterbacks after quarterbacks. Yeah, I love how you mentioned quarterbacks because we have to realize this is not the NFL. This exactly. is not the most valuable player. This is the best player. That is what the Heisman best. is, the best player in the FBS, regardless of if you're Power 5 or not. And Boise State is not one of those highly regarded programs but they've been a pretty successful program. I know they had an incredible win a long time ago in the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl. Great call. Needed to watch that, actually, after this episode. But JNT's putting them on the map, and I love how you mentioned the fourth quarter rushing yards. That literally is the definition of running well and being successful when it matters most to go with five touchdowns. And I think that they've had leads in the fourth quarter. And the defense knows they're going to run the ball. It's relatively predictable because when you're off, you want to two clock, and he's just running through them. And that is extremely impressive to me, and I truly hope that GNT keeps it up. He's on pace for around 2,600 scrimmage yards and 30-something touchdowns. It, when I say it, I'm like, what am I even yeah. saying? I mean, it's not a reality. I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, going back to quarterbacks, it's similar to how Joe Burrow approach, is approached about his Heisman year. I mean, he broke records he broke like the yards like throwing yards um touchdown he had like 60 touchdowns something like that yeah that's nuts those are numbers i don't 
think of in like how many games do they play a year? Fifteen? Like uh fourteen? Twelve. Twelve? I mean like yeah. including playoffs. But like, like obviously 14, in the regular yeah, season yeah. it's short to throw yeah. sixty touchdowns is nuts. And Janty's just like proving week after week why he should be winning the Heisman. And like not saying Travis Hunter isn't, but Janty is just much better. And I saw some of a video this morning about someone comparing Jeremiah Smith um, to Ryan Williams. Yeah. They're so different, but so close comparably. Jeremiah Smith is so much better. So much more gain on him. It's crazy. I'm going to, this is a hot take, but Jeremiah Smith is the best receiver in all of college football. Williams, he's 17. He's a little kid still. He does not know a thing or two how to run a program, and he was never in a Saban program. So he's not really getting his butt kicked by DeVore all the time. I want to hear your thoughts on my hot take. So I do think that Jeremiah Smith is a dog, and Gino I know mentioned a couple uh, weeks ago that I think he's his cousin, and or he's known him for a long time, and he said he's going to be the greatest receiver ever. Jeremiah Smith is awesome. He's already on pace to break Ohio State. Like, NCAA records. Yeah. I mean, Ohio State has been regarded as one of the few wide receiver U's, like LSU. Yeah, they that kind just of stuff. produce first round after Ron first Ron Williams round is 17 years old. Yeah. And in that back and forth game, they're up 28 nothing. Georgia comes back. And you need a play. Must have it. Milrow. One play. Touchdown. Yeah. Throws Boom. it deep. And for Ryan Williams. Tackles, I think, exactly. Play. He, what, what he did was just remarkable as a 17-year-old because... It's ball tracking, high football IQ, makes the catch. Normally, on most of those catches, the receiver's going to fall down. It's tough to keep your balance. Catches it, spins, makes two Georgia defensive backs run into each other. They look like they were the playing zone. like Mississippi State or something, some cupcake school. Yeah. It was just, I mean, when, when someone in Alabama makes, as Ryan Williams did, makes Georgia defensive backs, some of the best players in the entire nation, look like Pop Warner players, it catches my eye. And Ryan Williams, of course, has a lot to improve upon because he's, he's so going young. to be just a true freshman, just like Jeremiah Smith. But he still has a couple years. Of course, he can't go into the NFL anytime soon, yeah. which is good for him because he's, he's going to be super nuclear young into the when NFL. he goes into the NFL. But for Milrow to be trusting a 17-year-old yeah. is just it's incredible. Confidence. And confidence, the chemistry that they've developed, and it shows their amazing part about college football, Brian Denny Stadium in Tuscaloosa was going crazy. You could see the Georgia fans that play like the play before, the few Georgia fans that were there were going nuts. And then after, you couldn't even hear anything because they knew that the game was effectively over because Alabama won. You, you talk about the play, the, the one play to take back the lead on Georgia. But here's my argument. Did you watch the highlights of Jeremiah Smith? over Michigan State? Did you see those one-handed catches? Did you see him carry that team past a really struggling Michigan State team? doesn't matter that they're such a struggling team. He individually won that game. He had two touchdowns, 102 yards. I think Jeremiah Smith is a more polished receiver than Ryan Williams. However, going against Georgia and having the game he had especially the body control, which is something that really cannot be taught, just technique and practice and building your body and keeping yourself in game shape. Brian Williams has it. And it's going to be interesting to see, really not this year, but next couple of years, Williams and Jeremiah Smith going at it. I would love to see them play against each other, to be honest, because there right. must be so much respect Could between the two. happen in playoff setting. Yeah, but uh, Michigan and Indiana is going to be Ohio State, so it's fine. Yeah. But mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. love that. Love talking about Travis Hunter, Heisman candidate, Jeremiah Smith, Ryan Williams. What's up? It's been a great rest of the college football season. And let's get let's into take it to the Hoosiers. The Hoosiers? Who who? Hoosiers? Who who Hoosiers? Five and oh. First time since nineteen sixty seven. What are your thoughts on that, Kobe? I don't even have any words. Yeah. We were both at the game. I've never experienced an Indiana game like that before. Because in the rain. In the rain, but that, the it, proved. Was it was packed the whole game. Packed, and you couldn't hear anything, quarter. which makes me so happy yeah. for an Indiana football game to be like that. 
I mean, I think playing in the rain proved that this team needed to be ranked, which they are, AP23. Um, it proved how hard it is to play football in the rain, and they went out there very tight up until the fourth quarter, took away the lead. In in the fourth quarter specifically, it got even more rainy. And they beat a solid Maryland team. I'm not saying Maryland was bad. They played solid, and it was definitely their best opponent yet. Um, and let's take a look at what linebacker Aiden Fisher had to say in his post-press conference. I think that was a great test for us. Um, you know, a new team, a lot of new faces. You need to face adversity at some point in your season. Um, so doing that today, I think, was awesome. And looking at the way we responded, uh, it was even better. And it's really big for our team going forward. Aiden Fisher, the transfer from JMU, came into this program with not that many people knowing who he is as a player. But he's taking this leadership role, this middle linebacker role, number four in the middle. And you can just see the communication between him and the coaches, him and the players, the defense, especially earlier on in the game when, unfortunately, Curtis Rourke, who ended the game off playing amazing, but mm -hmm. had two early picks. The defense kept him in the game to allow the offense to gain the rhythm as they've been averaging around 47 points per game in the first five games of the season. Crazy. But I love that he says, I think it was a great test for us. He's acknowledging that Maryland was not an easy team, new team and a lot of new phases. You need to face adversity at some point in the season mm -hmm. because it can't all be a walk in the park. It can't all be these blowouts. There need to be games that are close where you can learn from it and improve. And this is exactly what Aiden Fisher means. And every single player, especially the notable players like Omar Cooper Jr., Elias Surratt, who's just a Mike Evans type of player, Ellison and Lawson, and especially Curtis Worth, the quarterback, all follow after that mentality. And it all starts with Coach Sig and just the way he leads the team. I mean, I agree. It was a big win. Um, he spoke, Fisher spoke beautifully about it. I mean, it really proved where this team is going in the future. They are traveling to Chicago this weekend to play Northwestern. And obviously Northwestern isn't, you know, the scariest opponent. But they fight. Just a few years ago, they had a, the last few years, they keep it close to the Ohio State. It's windy there. I mean, the windy city. It's hard to play there. And they're not even playing at their normal home stadium. They're playing on the shore where it is going to be windy. It's going to be another test this week. I'm not saying it's going to be as hard as what Maryland was. But... They got something to prove, and they can go clinch a bowl game. This is something we haven't seen yet here. It's something a lot of people at this school have not seen. I'm excited. I know you're excited. And all I have to say is go Hoosiers. Yeah, go Hoosiers. The number one goal. I don't want to hear anyone talking about this game, this game, this game. The number one goal is every play at a time. Get the win against Northwestern. One week at a time. Clinch a playoff, or clinch a bowl game. Move up in the rankings. And then we'll figure it out. But there's only one task right now, is we, win the game. Yep. That's it. That's all we should be hearing. And I just love the leadership. These players are new players. Not easy to go into a new system. Coach Say clearly is well-liked by his players, and he has the right mentality, and I love what Fisher said. And go Hoosiers. Thanks for listening, um, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Podium. Yeah.